So have you ever heard of data structures and algorithms? No? Well, let me tell you about them. They are like the building blocks of computer science and programming. Think of them as the tools in a carpenter's toolbox, except they are for programmers. Hello everyone and welcome to this video on data structures and algorithms in Python by IntelliPath. With data structures, you can store and organize data in a way that makes it easier to access and work with. It's like having a really organized closet. You can find everything you need quickly and efficiently. And algorithms are like the instructions for putting together a piece of furniture. They tell the computer what steps to take to solve a problem. With the right tools and instructions, you can create programs that are faster, more efficient and powerful. Plus, learning about data structures and algorithms is like solving puzzles. It's like trying to figure out the best way to organize a bunch of socks in a drawer or trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. It's challenging, but it's also fun and satisfying when you finally figure it out. So stay till the end to find out all about data structures and algorithms. With that, let us take a look at the agenda. First, we'll talk about what are data structures. Then we'll look into what are algorithms. Then we're going to discuss why are data structures and algorithms important. Then we'll look into time and space complexity. Then we'll look at the different types of data structures. Similarly, we'll look at the different types of algorithms. And with that, we'll conclude. But before we begin, Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to receive regular updates from us. So let's begin by talking about what are data structures. Data structures are significant concepts in computer science that aid in developing efficient programs in any language. In general, a data structure is a way of organizing and storing data in a computer program so that it can be accessed and used efficiently. Python is a high-level, interpreted, interactive and object-oriented scripting language that allows us to explore data structures basics in a more straightforward manner than other programming languages. Using appropriate data structures can help make your code more efficient, especially when dealing with large amounts of data. Now let's look at what are algorithms. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step technique that outlines a collection of instructions that must be followed in a specific order to get the desired result. Algorithms are often developed independently of underlying languages meaning an algorithm can be implemented in multiple programming languages. From the data structure point of view, the following are some important categories of algorithms. Starting with search, an algorithm to search an item in a data structure. Sort is an algorithm to sort items in a certain order. Insert is an algorithm to insert an item in a data structure. Update is an algorithm to update an existing item in a data structure. And finally, delete is an algorithm to delete an existing item from a data structure. Now we'll see why are data structures and algorithms important. Data structures and algorithms are important for several reasons. First, they allow programmers to write efficient and scalable code that can handle large amounts of data. Second, they provide a common language and set of tools for solving problems in computer science and related fields. Finally, understanding data structures and algorithms is essential for working with and contributing to open source software projects and passing technical interviews. Now let's talk about time and space complexity. In computer science, there is always more than one way to solve a problem using multiple algorithms. As a result, it is critical to apply a method to compare the answers in order to determine which one is optimal. The method must be independent of the system and its setup on which the algorithm is running. The number of inputs has a direct correlation and can differentiate between two algorithms without ambiguity. There are two such methods used that are time complexity and space complexity. Let us talk about time complexity. An algorithm's time complexity estimates the amount of time it takes to run as a function of the length of the input. It should be noted that the time to execute is determined by the length of the input rather than the actual execution time of the machine on which the algorithm is operating. Now let's talk about space complexity. When utilizing a computer to solve a problem, Memory is required to store temporary data or the ultimate solution while the program runs. The amount of memory required by the algorithm to solve a particular problem is referred to as the algorithm's space complexity. The space complexity of an algorithm estimates the amount of space required to perform an algorithm as a function of the input length. Now we look at different types of data structures. Data structures are fundamentally divided into two types that are linear and nonlinear. Talking about linear data structures, First is array. An array is a data structure that stores a collection of elements of the same data type in contiguous memory locations. The elements of an array are accessed using an index which represents the position of the element in the array. 
Arrays are a fundamental data structure in computer science and are used in a wide variety of applications. They are particularly useful for storing and manipulating large amounts of data efficiently. As accessing an element in an array can be done in constant time. In Python, arrays can be implemented using the built-in array module in the standard library or using the more powerful NumPy library. So let's look into implementation of arrays using the array module. The array module in Python provides a simple implementation of arrays that can be used to store homogeneous data. Here is an example of how to create an array of integers using the array module. In this example, we import the array module from the standard library and create an array of integers using the array function. The first argument to array specifies the type of elements in the array, in this case i for integers, and the second argument is a list of the initial values for the array. We can then access the elements of the array using indexing, just like with a list. For example, ARR of index 0 would give us the first element of the array, which is 1. The array module supports several different data types, including signed and unsigned integers, floating point numbers, and characters. Now let's look at implementation of arrays using NumPy. NumPy is a powerful Python library that provides support for multidimensional arrays and a wide range of mathematical operations on them. Here's an example of how to create a NumPy array in Python. Now let's move on to Stack. Stack is a linear data structure in computer science that stores a collection of elements and provides two main operations, push and pop. The push operation adds an element to the top of the stack and the pop operation removes the top element from the stack. Stack follows the last in first out principle, which means that the last element to be added to the stack will be the first one to be removed. Stacks are used in a wide variety of applications such as expression evaluation, backtracking algorithms and function call management. Now we'll look at the implementation of stack. In Python, stacks can be implemented using an array or a linked list. Here's an example of how to implement a stack using an array. In this implementation, we define a stack class that uses a Python list as the underlying data structure. The push method adds an element to the top of the stack using the append method of the list. The pop method removes the top element from the stack using the pop method of the list. The peak method returns the top element of the stack without removing it and the empty method checks if the stack is empty. To use the stack, we first create an instance of the stack class. We can then push elements onto the stack using the push method. We can remove elements from the stack using the pop method. We can then check the top element of the stack using the peak method. And we can check if the stack is empty using the isEmpty method. Now let's move on to queues. Queue is a data structure that stores a collection of elements in a specific order. The main characteristic of a queue is that it follows the first and first out principle where the first element added to the queue is the first one to be removed. A common analogy for a queue is a line of people waiting for a service such as a ticket counter or a ride at an amusement park. The first person to join the line is the first to be served and the last person to join the line has to wait for everyone else to be served first. There are two types of queues. A linear queue is a basic queue that follows the first and first out principle where elements are added to the end of the queue and removed from the front of the queue. Whereas in a circular queue, a queue that uses a circular buffer to implement the queue. This allows for efficient use of memory and faster execution, but requires careful handling of edge cases. So let us now look at the implementation of queue using the queue module. In Python, a queue can be implemented using the queue module, which provides the queue class that implements a synchronized queue. The queue class can be used to implement both FIFO and LIFO queues, depending on the argument passed to its constructor. Here is an example of implementing a FIFO queue using the queue class. In this example, we create an instance of the queue class and add three elements to it using the put method. Then, we remove the elements from the queue using the get method, which returns the first element that is added to the queue. Alternatively, we can implement a queue using an array in Python. Here's an example of implementing a FIFO queue using an array. In this implementation, we define a queue class that uses an array to store the elements. The NQ method adds an element to the end of the queue using append method and the DQ method removes an element from the beginning of the queue using the pop method. The isEmpty method checks if the queue is empty and the size method returns the number of elements in the queue. Now let's move on to linked list. A linked list is a data structure that stores a collection of elements in a linear order. 
Unlike an array, which stores the elements in a contiguous block of memory, a linked list stores each element in a separate object called node. Each node contains both the element and a reference to the next node in the list. The main advantage of a linked list over an array is that it allows for efficient insertion and removal of elements at any position in the list since we only need to update the references of the nodes before and after the inserted or removed element. However, accessing an element at a specific position in a linked list requires traversing the list from the beginning, which takes big O of n time complexity on average, where n is the number of elements in the list. Now let's look at the type of linked list. Starting with singly linked list, a linked list where each node contains a reference to the next node, but not to the previous node. Then there is doubly linked list, a linked list where each node contains a reference to the next node and the previous node. And finally, circular linked list, a linked list where the last node contains a reference to the first node, creating a circular structure. Now let's look at the implementation of Q. In Python, we can implement a linked list using a node class that contains the element and a reference to the next node. Here is an example of implementing a singly linked list. In this implementation, we define a node class that contains the element and a reference to the next node. We also define a linked list class that contains a reference to the head first node. The isEmpty method checks if the list is empty and the addFirst and addLast methods add a new node containing the element to the beginning or the end of the list respectively. The insertAfter method inserts a new node containing the element after a specified node in the list and the remove method removes the first node containing the element from the list. Finally, the printList method traverses the list from the head and prints the elements. Moving on to the next data structure, that is trees. A tree is a hierarchical data structure that consists of nodes connected by edges. Each node in the tree represents a value or element and the edges represent the relationship between the nodes. The topmost node in the tree is called the root and every other node is a descendant of the root. Nodes that have the same parent are called siblings and no nodes with children are called leaves. Let us look at the type of trees. Moving on to binary search tree, where a binary tree where the left child of a node contains a value smaller than the parent and the right child contains a value larger than the parent. This allows for efficient searching and sorting of elements. Next is AVL tree, a self-balancing binary search tree where the heights of the left and right subtrees at any node differ by at most one. This ensures efficient searching and insertion of elements. Finally, red black tree, another self-balancing binary search tree that maintains a balance between height and node count. This ensures efficient searching and insertion of elements while also providing a guarantee that the height of the tree will not exceed big O of log n complexity. Now let's look at the implementation of trees. In Python, we can implement a tree using a node class that contains the element and references to its children. Here is an example of implementing a binary tree. In this implementation, we define a node class that contains the element and references to its left and right children. We also define a binary tree class that contains a reference to the root node. The isEmpty method checks if the tree is empty and the insert method inserts a new node containing the element at the first available position in the tree. The search method searches for a node containing the element in the tree using a breadth first search. Finally, the print tree method traverses the tree in a breadth first order and prints the elements. Let's move on to the next data structure that is graphs. A graph is a data structure used to represent a set of objects called vertices or nodes and the connections that are called edges between them. Graphs are a flexible and powerful tool used to model and solve a wide range of problems from network routing to social network analysis. Graphs can be either directed or undirected. In a directed graph, the edges have a direction and represent a one-way relationship between the vertices. In an undirected graph, the edges have no direction and represent a two-way relationship between the vertices. Graphs can also be weighted or unweighted. A weighted graph is one in which the edges have a weight or cost associated with them. An unweighted graph is one in which all edges have the same weight. Graphs can be implemented in several ways. One common way is to use an adjacency matrix in which two-dimensional arrays that represent the connections between the vertices. The value in cell ij of the matrix represents the weight of the edge from the vertex i to vertex j. If there are no edge between the two vertices, the value is often set to infinity or a large number. Another way to implement a graph is to use an adjacency list, which is a list that contains all vertices in the graph 
and the edges that connect them. Each vertex in the list has a corresponding linked list that contains vertices to which it's connected to, along with the weight of the edge. Now let's move on to implementation of graph using adjacency list. Here is an example of how to implement an undirected, unweighted graph using an adjacency list in Python. In this implementation, the add vertex method adds a vertex to the graph and the add edge method adds an edge between the two vertices. The print graph method simply prints out the graph in a readable format. Here is an example of how to use this implementation to create and print a graph. As you can see, the output is displayed on the screen. Moving on to hash tables. In data structures, a hash table is a data structure that stores key value pairs in an array-like structure where the keys are hashed to unique indices in the array using a hash function. Hash tables are used to implement associative arrays or mappings of key value pairs where lookup, insertion and deletion operations can be performed efficiently in big O of one time complexity on average. In Python, hash tables can be implemented using dictionaries which are built-in data structures in Python that store key value pairs. Python dictionaries use a hash function to hash the keys to unique indices in the hash table and handle collisions using a technique called open addressing with linear probing. Now let's look at the implementation of hash tables using dictionaries. In this implementation, the hash table class is defined with two methods, insert and get. The insert method takes a key value pair as an input and stores it in the hash table using key as the index. The get method takes a key as input and returns the value associated with that key in the hash table. Now let's move on to types of algorithms. Starting with sorting algorithms, sorting is a fundamental operation in computer science that involves arranging elements in a collection in a particular order. There are several sorting algorithms that have been developed over the years, each with its own advantages and disadvantages depending on the specific use case. Let us look at bubble sort. It compares adjacent elements in a list and swaps them if they are in the wrong order, repeatedly iterates through the list until no swaps are necessary. Its time complexity is big O of n square and its space complexity is big O of 1. Moving on to selection sort, it finds the smallest elements in a list and swaps it with the first element and repeats this process for the remaining elements in the list. The time complexity of selection sort is big O of n square and the space complexity is big O of 1. Moving on to insertion sort, it builds a sorted list by iterating through an unsorted list and inserting each element into its proper position. The time complexity is big O of n square and the space complexity is 1. Moving on to merge sort, merge sort divides a list into two halves, recursively sorts each half and then merges the two halves together. The time complexity is big O of n log n and the space complexity is big O of n. Moving on to quick sort, Quicksort picks a pivot element in a list and partitions the list into two halves around the pivot such that all elements to the left of the pivot are smaller and all elements to the right are larger. It recursively sorts the two halves of the list. The time complexity for quicksort is big O of n log n and the space complexity is big O of log n on average and big O of n on worst case. Moving on to heap sort, it builds a heap data structure from the list and repeatedly extracts the minimum element from the heap, which is placed at the end of the list. The time complexity for heap sort is big O of n log n, and the space complexity is big O of 1. Next on the list is counting sort. It counts the number of occurrences of each element in a list and uses this information to sort the list. It only works for non-negative integers or values within a certain range. The time complexity for counting sort is big O of n plus k, where k is the range of values in the list and the space complexity is big O of k. The final algorithm on the list is radix sort. Sorts elements in a list by considering their individual digits or bits from the least significant to the most significant. It requires a stable sorting algorithm as a subroutine. The time complexity of radix sort is big O of d into n plus k, where d is the number of digits or bits in the elements and k is the range of values in the list. And the space complexity is big O of n plus k. Now let's move on to searching algorithms. Searching is a common operation in computer science and is used to find the location or value of a particular item in a collection of data. Searching algorithms are used to perform these operations efficiently and effectively. There are several searching algorithms that are commonly used in computer science, starting with linear search. 
Linear search is a simple search algorithm that works by sequentially checking each element of the collection until a match is found or the end of the collection is reached. It has a time complexity of big O of n, where n is the number of elements in the collection. Linear search is typically used on small collections or unsorted collections. Next is binary search. Binary search is a more efficient search algorithm that works by dividing the collection in half and comparing the target value to the middle element. If the middle element is equal to the target value, the search is successful. Otherwise, the search continues on the left or right half of the collection depending on where the target value is greater or less than the middle element. Binary search has a time complexity of big O of log n, where n is the number of elements in the collection. Binary search is typically used on sorted collections. Next is interpolation search. Interpolation search is a variant of binary search that works best on collections that are uniformly distributed. Instead of dividing the collection in half, interpolation search uses a linear interpolation to estimate the position of the target value. The estimated position is then used to determine which half of the collection to search next. Interpolation search has an average time complexity of big O of log n, but can have a worse time complexity of big O of n. Moving on to jump search, jump search is a search algorithm that works by jumping ahead a fixed number of elements and then checking if the target value is less than or equal to the current element. If the target value is less than or equal to the current element, Linear search is used to find the target value within the current block. Otherwise, the process is repeated with a new block. Jump search has a time complexity of big O of root n, where n is the number of elements in the collection. Next is exponential search. Exponential search is a search algorithm that works by first finding a range that contains the target value and then performing a binary search within that range. Exponential search begins by checking the first element of the collection and then doubling the position of the search until either the target value is found or the end of the collection is reached. Exponential search has a time complexity of big O of log n, where n is the number of elements in the collection. Last is hashing. Hashing is a technique used to map a large and potentially infinite set of inputs to a smaller set of outputs. In the context of searching, hashing can be used to quickly find the location of a target value within a collection. Hashing works by taking the target value and mapping it to a specific index in a hash table. The value at the mapped index is then checked to see if it matches the target value. Hashing has a time complexity of big O of 1 on average, but can have a worst case time complexity of big O of n. Now let's move on to graph algorithms. Graph algorithms are algorithms used to solve problems on graphs, which are mathematical structures consisting of vertices and nodes and edges connecting them. These algorithms are widely used in applications such as social networks, transportation systems, computer networks, and more. Here are some popular graph algorithms, starting with depth-first search. DFS is a traversal algorithm that starts at a specified vertex and explores as far as possible along each branch before backtracking. It is implemented using a stack and can be used to check if a graph is connected, find strongly connected components, or detect cycles. Second is breadth-first search. BFS is another traversal algorithm that starts at a specified vertex and explores all the neighboring vertices before moving to the next level. It is implemented using a queue and can be used to find the shortest path between two vertices. Third is Dijkstra algorithm. Dijkstra algorithm is used to find the sh shortest path between two vertices in a weighted graph. It works by maintaining a priority queue of vertices and the distances from the source vertex and repeatedly selecting the vertex with the minimum distance and updating the distances of its neighbors. Next is Bellman-Ford algorithm. Bellman-Ford algorithm is also used to find the shortest path between two vertices in a weighted graph, but it can handle negative edge weights. It works by relaxing the edges in the graph repeatedly until the distances converge. Next on the list is Kruskal's algorithm. Kruskal's algorithm is used to find the minimum spanning tree of a weighted undirected graph. It works by sorting the edges by weight and adding them to the tree one by one, making sure not to create any cycles. Finally, Prim's algorithm. Prim's algorithm is also used to find the minimum spanning tree of a weighted undirected graph. It works by starting with an arbitrary vertex and adding the closest edge to the tree one by one making sure not to create any cycles. Let's talk about dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a technique used in computer science to solve problems by breaking them down 
into smaller, more manageable subproblems. The idea behind dynamic programming is to avoid redundant work by storing the solutions to previously solved subproblems in a table and using those solutions to solve larger problems. Dynamic programming is especially useful for problems where the solution can be recursively defined in terms of smaller subproblems. Some examples of problems that can be solved using dynamic programming includes the knapsack problem, the longest common subsequence problem, and the Fibonacci sequence. To implement dynamic programming, we need to follow a few basic steps. First, define the problem in terms of subproblems. In order to use dynamic programming, we need to be able to break the problem down into smaller subproblems. For example, if we are trying to find the longest common subsequence between two strings, we could break down the problem into finding the largest common subsequence between each prefix of the two strings. Next is defining the base case. The base case is the simplest version of the problem that we can solve directly. For example, the base case for Fibonacci sequence is that f of 0 equals 0 and f of 1 equals 1. Next is defining the recurrence relation. The recurrence relation is the formula we use to calculate the solution to a subproblem in terms of the solutions to a smaller subproblem. For example, the recurrence relation for the Fibonacci sequence is f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Another technique in dynamic programming is memoization. Memoization involves storing the solutions to subproblems in a dictionary or some other data structure. When we need to solve a new subproblem, we first check if we have already solved it. If we have, we return the stored solution. If not, we calculate the solution and store it for future use. The next important topic in dynamic programming is tabulation. Tabulation involves creating a table to store the solutions to subproblems. We start by solving the base case and filling in the table with the solutions to smaller subproblems. We then use the table to solve larger subproblems until we reach the solution to the original problem. In conclusions, data structures and algorithms are an essential topic for any programmer to learn and understand. They provide the foundation for efficient and effective programming, enabling us to solve complex problems and create optimized solutions. By understanding the principles of data structures and algorithms, we can write code that is not only functional but also scalable, maintainable, and easy to understand. We can also optimize our programs to ensure that they run as efficiently as possible, minimizing computational resources and improving performance. Moreover, data structures and algorithms play a crucial role in computer science, powering many of the applications and systems that we use every day. From search engines to social media platforms, from video games to financial modeling tools, these concepts underlie some of the most important developments in technology and innovation. Overall, learning about data structures and algorithms is a key component of becoming a successful programmer. It opens up new opportunities for solving problems and creates a deeper understanding of the underlying principles that power the world of computing. So with that, we come to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts.